to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Peter. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study of God's Word, and we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members and individual congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You would be their honored guest at any of their worship assemblies, whether that's Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study. We encourage you to check out the Church of Christ in your area. If you've got a question about the Scriptures, you'd like to study the Bible, you want to know more about the plan of salvation or the church, You'll find friendly people there who want to help men and women know God and get to heaven. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you'll find a wide variety of good Bible study materials. We have multiple lessons on various topics. We have lessons on every book in both the Old and the New Testament and a, a series of studies on various subjects as well. And they're all available to you free of charge. It's thegospelofchrist.com. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, or any of our lessons on DVD or CD or a digital download, you can log on to our website, fill out our media request form, and we'd be glad to make those available to you free of charge. And of course, in the fast-paced world that we live in today, don't forget to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available free from both the Google and the Apple Play stores. You can access those as well. As we think today, about the lessons of 1 Peter, we want to realize that in 1 Peter, God is encouraging us to think about our responsibility to other people, our responsibility to our spouses, our responsibility to the lost, and what our responsibility ultimately is to God. And we begin in 1 Peter chapter 3 by thinking about the responsibility of the Christian wife to her husband, hoping to win him to the Lord. Do you know anybody who's uh, uh, married and they're not both Christians? Maybe do you know a wife who's a faithful member of the Lord's church, studies her Bible regularly, loves the Lord, and, and is trying her best to go to heaven, but her husband isn't a member of the Lord's church? Or maybe it's the other way around. The husband isn't a member and the wife is. How do we convert our spouse to the Lord? Well, Peter tells us how, one way how, in 1 Peter chapter 3, I want you to notice verses 1 through 6 with me. The Bible says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so the Christian wife, how is she going to win her husband to the Lord? She's going to do that by her conduct. He says they may without a word win them to the Lord. Now friend, that doesn't mean that somebody 
couldn't talk to them, that you couldn't talk to them. But sometimes you reach a point where a person needs to see it as well as hear it. And that is in essence what Peter says. Yeah, we need to tell them the gospel. We want to look for opportunities to study the Bible with them. But one of the powerful things that a Christian wife can do to win her husband to the Lord is to let him see Christianity in Christ living in her each and every day. And so she can win him to Christ by her conduct. That is, she's reverent. She honors the things that are holy. She holds up God and His truth by her lifestyle. Her conduct is such that it's honorable. She's not a person who is so focused on appearance and worldliness and, and the adornment of everything outwardly. Rather, she's focused on the inner person. That is, she's trying to be like Christ each and every day. When that husband who's not a Christian looks at his wife, he sees her good character. He sees her manner of life. And he knows every day she's trying to be a good Christian and follow the Lord. She's adorned with submission to God first, to Christ, and to her husband. And that is an indicator of her concern for godly things. And so what this text is telling us is, by your good example... By your influence, you can be an indicator or you can be an influence for your husband who may not be a Christian. And to husbands, Peter is also going to give advice. He says to wives, you can win your husbands by your example without a word. And to husbands, you need to dwell with your wife with understanding. What's our responsibility to our wives, men? that we be understanding toward them. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3 and notice what Peter says next in verse number 7. Peter says, Husbands, likewise, are you also dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands are to honor their wives. They're to hold them up on a platform. They are to be understanding toward them. We're not all made the same way. We don't all think alike. My wife doesn't think like me. I don't think like her. But I need to be understanding to what she needs, what she feels, and the things that she needs to be secure and happy in this life. And a failure to do that. The failure to be, for a husband to fail to be a good and understanding husband. What's the consequence of that? Listen to verse 7. This is serious now. That your prayers may not be hindered. If I'm not treating my wife like I ought to treat her, then friend, my prayer doesn't even approach the throne of God. You see, Psalm 66 verse 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Meaning in our context, if I know I ought to be understanding with my wife and I'm not, I'm quick-tempered, I don't give any consideration to her and her needs, friend, I've got iniquity in my heart and I'm not doing what God wants me to do. And so in this whole section about our responsibility to our mates, let's ask ourselves these questions. Wives, are you putting your emphasis on the spiritual where it needs to be and not the worldly? Are you being submissive to your own husbands? Husbands, are you being the kind of leader that you ought to be? Are you being understanding with your wife and are you doing everything you can to help her? And then we now think about another responsibility that we have and that is the Christian's responsibility to be always ready to share the gospel with others. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 15. Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. The Christian's got to be ready to share the gospel. Be ready always to give a defense. A defense is a reasoned, intellectual answer based on the evidence. Not an I think, or not an I feel, or not a best guess. It's a logical, biblical answer to why we believe what we believe. Why do you believe in Christ? Why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in the Bible? What is God's plan of salvation? Why do you believe in these things? 
Christians have got to be ready to share that message with the Lord. Does, we're not the Lord's silent partners, okay? God expects us to spread the message. Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel unto every creature. Matthew 28, 18, Mark 16, verse 15. But friend, here's an important point. If I'm to be ready always, that means I've got to get ready. The only way to be ready is to get ready and to stay ready. Study your Bible so that you can be prepared to talk to others about the gospel. Now, friend, we're not talking about... Peter says to give a ready reason defense of the gospel. I'm not saying that if somebody comes up to you and says, I need an exegesis on the four horsemen of Revelation, that you've got to be ready just like that. We're talking about the fundamentals of the Christian faith about how to become a Christian, how to live a good Christian life, how to worship God, what, what we believe about the Lord's church. I need to be ready about that. And friend, of course, to be ready, as we've said, we've got to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. And so I want to spend time preparing so that I can talk to others about the gospel. And that doesn't mean you've got to have it all from memory. You could write that down. You could invite them over for a Bible study. You could go through your notes with them on that. But some way, I need to study and be ready to share the gospel with others. And you know, sometimes people ask us about subjects that the Bible is very, very clear on. The world may be confused on it. The world may teach a lot of error on it. But the Bible's clear on it. And friend, one of those subjects Peter mentions is the subject of baptism. I want you to look in your Bible with me in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. And I want you to notice what Peter says about baptism. And as you're turning there and as you're thinking about this, here's kind of what a lot of people in the world will say. The world will say, baptism is a good thing to do. We want to be like Christ and do it because He did it. It's something that's good to do, something we ought to do, but a big majority of people will say, baptism is not essential to salvation. You do not have to be baptized to be saved. Friend, did you know Peter explicitly says you do? Explicitly says that in 1 Peter 3.21. Look at these words with me. Let's read them in our Bible together. 1 Peter 3.21. The Bible says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just like the eight so and the context is, he's talking about Noah and the eight souls on the ark. The eight souls on the ark were saved by water in that the water lifted up that boat and they were spared. He says, in like manner also, baptism does now also save us. Friend, listen very carefully today. If God says, and He does right here, if God says, baptism does now also save us, can I ask, why in the world would anybody ever say, baptism doesn't save, baptism isn't essential, it's something you ought to do, but you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven? In the Bible, on multiple occasions, the Scriptures teach baptism is essential to salvation. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter stood up and preached, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 22 16, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And listen to what Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Now, oftentimes when people hear this, they say, well, you're, you're putting too much emphasis on the water. Friend, it's not the water. There's nothing, what we mean by that is, there's nothing mystical or magical in the water. Did you hear what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21? It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. What's that mean? There's not any magical potion in the water. It's simply because God said to and that's the answer of a good conscience. Now, we also want to emphasize this. Do we believe and does the Bible teach 
that it's Jesus who saves. Absolutely. Without Christ, there's no salvation. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21, you'll call His name Emmanuel, Jesus, which is translated God with us. He'll save His people from their sins. Does the Bible teach that the blood and the sacrifice and the death of Jesus saves? Absolutely. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9, 22. My friend, does the Bible teach? We contact the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus in the water of baptism? It absolutely does. Why is baptism essential to salvation? Because that's what God said. That's where God said we contact the Lord's death. How do we know that? Romans 6, verses 2 through 4. As many of us as were baptized into Christ, listen to this now, were baptized into His death, therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into His death that we may rise out of that to walk in newness of life. We contact the death of Jesus which saves at the point of baptism because that's where God said one contacts it at. Now, sometimes though, as Christians, as we live in this world, uh, our responsibility to others may be that, yeah, we're going to have to suffer from time to time. We're talking about our responsibility to other people. We've noticed that wives and husbands have got to work together. We've noticed we've got to be ready to teach the gospel. But sometimes part of the Christian responsibility is we're going to suffer for being a child of God. I want you to notice what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible records these words. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. My mind has set has got to be, yeah, I may suffer for the Lord. And that's okay if I do in view of all that Jesus did for me. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul, after he was stoned and left outside of Lystra and Derby. He rose up and he said, we must through many persecutions, tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And friend, if I know that, I need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.21 And I need to count any suffering that I do for Christ a joy since Jesus has done so much for me as a child of God so that I can live in such a way that I bring glory and honor to Him in every day. Now, a couple of other responsibilities we have, and it's this. Christians are responsible to speak what God has spoken, to say what God has already said. I'm not responsible to come up with it out of thin air, to create my own ideas or my own doctrines. As a Christian, I'm responsible to say what God has already said in His Word. Look in 1 Peter 4, verse number 11 with me. The Bible says, If anyone speaks... Let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Friend, as we think about the Christian responsibility, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Our responsibility to God is to say what he's already said. That's what a Christian ought to do. You want to know the answer to a Bible question? Let's look in the Bible and see. Let's let God's voice be the voice we hear on that. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, we're told to preach the Word. God said to the prophet, the reluctant prophet Jonah in the long ago, preach the preaching that I tell you. Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Paul said to the young evangelist Titus in Titus 2 verse 1, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And I remember the words of, of, of uh, the, the, the prophet in 1 Kings 22 verse 14 who said, the prophet Micaiah, whatever my God says to me, that will I speak. That's the attitude Christians ought to be known for. I want to be known for saying, let's see what the Bible, here's what God says. Here's the book, chapter, verse where we can learn this is the right thing to do. And friend, when we say what God says and when we do what God wants us to do and when we speak where the Bible has already spoken, that's something to be proud of and not to be ashamed of. Don't ever be ashamed for standing up as a Christian. In fact, look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 4 verse 16. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. 
You know, it's good to be a child of God. And if I have to suffer a little for saying what the Bible says, then so be it. That may be our lot in life. But at least we're saying what God says. Romans 1.16, that's what's going to save people. We don't need to be ashamed of that at all. And so we want to stand up for truth and not be ashamed of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we look in 1 Peter chapter 5, I want you to see a couple of things that Peter drives home as it relates to elders and their responsibility. Did you know that the apostle Peter was also an elder in the Lord's church? Look in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. Peter says, The elders who are among you, I exhort, now watch this, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Isn't that interesting? Peter himself was an elder. Now to be an elder, 1 Timothy 3, a man must be married and he must have children. Matthew 8 verse 14, we know Peter had a mother-in-law, which clearly teaches he had a wife, for that mother-in-law was healed by, in that context. And so what are we learning here? Friend, the idea of Peter being the first pope, Peter being celibate, Peter starting that line of the papacy, Peter was an elder. He wasn't the first pope. That's not what we read in the Bible. We have no indication anywhere of that. We know he wasn't a celibate, for an elder must be married and have children. He, we don't find nowhere that he was the first pope. And so he was an elder in the Lord's church, which is a shepherd, an overseer, and who's responsible in encouraging others and helping them to get to heaven. Well, what's the elder's responsibility in that work? Elders are to shepherd the flock. Look at 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Friend, when you think about the work of an elder and what an awesome responsibility that is, they're to shepherd, that is, they're to lead, be leaders in the local congregation, encouraging, motivating, exhorting people to live right and to follow the teaching of God. Of course, Jesus in this context is the chief shepherd. We all follow Him. But what an awesome responsibility elders have. Hebrews 13 verse 17 tells us, We are to submit to and obey those who rule over us as those who will give an account for our souls. In matters not in making up laws, God's law is already settled, Psalm 119 verse 89, but in the encouragement in the function of the local congregation, in matters of option and expediency, elders do indeed have authority in that congregation and they're encouraged to shepherd the flock. They're not to be lords over the flock. They're, they're to be examples to the flock and live in such a way that God is honored and that His will and His law is uplifted in every way. And friend, we need that help. Listen carefully. We need the help in the local congregation and in our daily lives because the devil is an awesome enemy. He is a, a very serious enemy that every one of us has to fight. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Thinking about our responsibility. What's our responsibility towards Satan and sin? Look in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Friend, I, I have a responsibility towards Satan and towards sin. I am to be sober, to be vigilant, that is, to be on guard. And think of the picture here. He's like a roaring lion. If there were a lion on the loose and you were outside, wouldn't you be looking for it? Wouldn't you be on the alert? Wouldn't you be ready to protect yourself from that? Well, that's the idea. Be alert. Be awake. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, he's like that roaring lion looking to devour people. Well, what's my responsibility then? Resist him steadfast in the faith. Friend, the old saying, the devil made me do it, is absolutely not true. Christians have the power to resist him. 
Jesus has already defeated the devil on the cross. Hebrews 2 verse 14, and I can say no. I don't have to give in to his temptation and he can be resisted. I know he can be resisted because Jesus did it. Matthew chapter 4, Satan threw everything he had at Jesus. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Throw yourself down from the temple. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. And every time Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Friend, the good news today is you can resist Satan. You can overcome sin. And you can win the battle, spiritually speaking. How do you do that? My friend, you've got to be a child of God, to win the battle. Let's talk about our most important responsibility today. And that's my responsibility to God to obey the gospel. There's no hope. There's no joy. There's no resisting sin. There, there, there's no living a life full of joy if we're not a child of God. Friend, are you a Christian? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? Jesus said in John 8 verse 24, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. If you believe Christ, are you willing to turn from sin? Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Would you turn from a life of sin and turn to God? Would you do just like the Ethiopian eunuch? and confess Jesus as your Lord. Acts 8, verse 37, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, to have every evil deed washed away to be saved and to get on the straight and narrow path, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Remember what Peter said? 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Baptism does now also save us. The Lord said, unless a man is born of water, and the Spirit, He cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so if you're not a child of God, friend, take hold of that responsibility and that privilege and become a Christian today. If as a Christian, maybe your life is struggling, maybe you're dealing with difficulty, friend, God can help you with that. We want to help you. If we can help in any way, let us know. And may God help each of us to live in such a way that our lives will have the responsibility they need to bring honor and glory to Almighty God. We hope you'll join us next time as we study together more of the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the